Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SCA's 40th monthly Zoom presentation. We are now into our fourth year with no end in sight. My name is Brian Gallagher, and I'm the Vice President of the Society for Commercial Archaeology. I will be your host tonight. Welcome to all our guests and any new people that we have with us tonight. We're happy you took the time out of your summer evening to watch an SCA presentation. I hope you enjoy the show. And for anyone watching the recording of this episode of the SCA's monthly presentations who is not a member of the SCA, we earnestly ask you to consider joining. Funding for the various activities of the SCA comes almost exclusively from our membership. Just visit our website at www.sca-roadside.org and follow the links. Now I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's presentation. Journalist Mike Walker will take us through an examination of the 20th century American beachside hotel and motel architecture using Daytona, Florida for illustration. While on the surface, the buildings may seem simply fun and attuned to the vacation atmosphere of their locations, they reflect aspects of post-war America, the atomic age, the visions of the South Pacific returning servicemen, and the optimism of the USA at a technological and economic apex. This presentation will investigate how a confluence of historical, social, and aesthetic choices made tiki culture and the American vacation a world all their own. Mike Walker is a former instructor of digital humanities at the Los Angeles Film School. He holds an MFA in fine arts and a BFA in architectural history, both from the Savannah College of Art and Design. His journalism concerning sports, politics, and urban theory has been featured in leading publications, including the San Francisco Chronicle, Slate, the South China Morning Post, Top Soccer, and many others. His research interests are varied and include mid-century American architecture, Russian regional architecture, mosque design in Chechnya, contemporary Islamic architecture, artistic depictions of athletes, graphic design in action sports markets, and post-Soviet youth culture. That's quite an eclectic mix. So I'd like to ask Mike to come online and uh, start sharing his screen and, and uh, give us his presentation. Hello there. everyone, and thank you for such a warm welcome there, Brian. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speaking with all of you tonight. It is for, as Brian said, I have been a college instructor before as well as a journalist. And in neither of those venues do you very often get to speak on one topic, particularly to a very interested and educated audience as I have tonight in great depth. And it's just such honor and joy to be able to do that in this capacity. Daytona is a place that is very special to me. It is a place that I, um, I live about two hours away from Daytona, and it's a place that I started visiting because among the other things that I do, I am also a surfer. And sorry, just having a little bit of a technical problem, but I think we will be good now. I hope everyone can see my screen. Yeah, that's so, that yeah. fine, Mike. We got Great. it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. So yeah, I'm also a surfer, and if you're in Florida, the Daytona, New Smyrna Beach area, what we call Ponce Inlet is sort of a prime, along with Cocoa Beach, the prime surfing location. So I'd go over to Daytona and go surfing. And usually I'd spend the night. I'd, you know, when the waves were good, I'd spend several days over there. So this is actually a picture I took out from my surfboard, looking back at the coast and the beachfront and all of these high rise current beachfront condo and hotel buildings, motel buildings that are in Daytona Beach. So that was sort of the genesis of my interest in this topic. I was going over there to go surfing and I'd want to spend the night, want to spend the night on the beach so I could go surfing first thing in the morning. And I would often end up staying in a motel like this. And this is a seascape. I also like to call it dolphins, dolphins everywhere because you can see plenty of dolphins there on the facade of a building, on the gate coast, certainly in that wonderful sign. And when you go inside, there's more dolphins to greet you. It's a really wonderful building. I 
in all candor, I can't recommend staying there now because it's not kept up maybe as it should be, but the, the building is something else. And, you know, having a background in architectural history, I started thinking, well, what's the deal here? What is going on with not just this one example, the seascape, but even examples like this. This is a larger motel called uh, Perry's Ocean Edge. And as you can see, uh, adjacent to that, they have on the property, the Mango Sun, breakfast, lunch, and tiki bar. And I thought, what is going on here? So I stayed in several of these motels. I mean, obviously they were mid-century, most built probably in the early 1960s, a few earlier, a few later. But they all seemed to have something that was very theme-based to them. You know, with the seascape, it was the dolphins. But then I started seeing things in staying in some of these properties that were even more direct and even more narrative in how they were approaching things, such as the Aku Tiki. And to me, as an architectural historian, this was just so many things at once. First of all, we have the Moai, the large um, edifice of the face that is there on the sign is the Moai, and that is original. His eyes do light up at night. I have been told in my research for this topic this is the third time I've presented on this topic. So it's something that I've been researching since uh, 2019. And I was told that at one time there was actually a gas burner in this guy's noggin. And there at the top at night, they'd ignite it and it would shoot out burst of flame, which must have been something to see. But when Best Western took over the property, they did away with that, unfortunately. And as you're about to see, very sadly, some some other things have befallen this property that um, that I think are quite a shame, but I'll get into that in just a second. Let's look at what's going on here. We have a very direct example of facadism in the sense that this effort at creating a Polynesian, South Pacific looking style of architecture like this lodge has basically been pasted on what is very much a uh, perfect example of a mid 20th century commercial motel building. And I mean, it's literally, it couldn't be any more pasted on than it is. We have that lodge area, which serves today and always has served as a lobby, the front desk, if you will, where you see the man in the green shirt walking in. And you have this port cochere that comes out towards the sign. And all of this is speaking to you of the fact that it is tiki. It is Aku, it is Polynesian, and this is what's thematically and programmatically going on there. But on a programmatic level, you also have the down to business of each one of these. And th this is pretty cool, I think. I will hand it to them for this. Each one of those balconies you can see there on the left side is technically ocean view. It's not ocean front, but they all are angled in a way that their ocean view. And then if you go to the rear of a building facing the beach and the ocean, this is what you get. And I think this is lovely in its design aesthetics in itself, but you actually have the prime oceanfront suites there. And I got to stay in one of those. I wasn't even planning to, but one time, I think it was even the first time I stayed there, there was something wrong with the plumbing in my room with the sink kept leaking. So I complained and they moved me to one of the oceanfront suites, which is very nice of them. And it's really a beautiful view and it's a sort of experience that Florida has so much to offer on its own in its own regards, but it's basically Florida pretending to be Hawaii or pretending to be some South Pacific Island, which I found was really intriguing. And that's what got me started the spark to to research this topic. Now, something recently very unfortunate, in my opinion, has happened with the Aku Tiki. And Aku Tiki, if you go on any websites or anything talking about Tiki architecture, Aku Tiki comes up a lot. It's, if they talk about Daytona at all, Aku Tiki is one of the first properties, justifiably, that they bring up. But unfortunately, this is what has happened recently, that... Um, Sometime, I think, in I was over there in April of 2022, and it was still like this. 
And then I learned later, as you can see in this Google Street View, that I know they had a problem with the ceiling leaking in the lobby. And apparently they decided to renovate everything. It looks like they may have added some office space there because before they had a cathedral ceiling and sort of a clear story up there. And now they have these windows and they've sort of blocked it up. So I'd say they, they put some offices for the managers or something up there. But it's really sad to me because even the Port Cochere, they changed. And really, it's interesting that they left the sign and they kept the name of Akutiki Inn. And they kept the the traders, uh, the little tiki bar that they had there, but they totally did away with what really gave it some credibility as a quote unquote tiki property. And it's it's very sad to me. Now, I found this image that's extremely intriguing. I found it online and a lot of images you'll see tonight that are historical are from a collection or various collections actually of postcards. This was not identified. I think it was on sort of a Daytona history page, may have even just been a Google search, but it was not identified as whether this was a postcard or architectural rendering. It looks to me like a postcard. It's a little bit more than, it's not the way a rendering would have appeared in the, the 1960s necessarily, but it's intriguing because you don't have a Moai there but you have this great bodacious sign coming off the Port Cochere and you have everything else. And what you have over there to the right-hand side is Trader's Restaurant. And that was a restaurant and tiki bar with some of them. They, they've modified it in recent years. So it's not, not quite what you see there, but they still call it Trader's and they still have a little bit of a tiki motif since we're about to see there. So this got me really intrigued. What is going on here? Because little old me, I am fine going to the beach in Florida. I am blessed to live in Florida, you know, and I don't mind just going there and appreciating it for what it is, that it's Florida. But it seemed like the hotelers and business people, people who were in the tourism industry, at least in the 1960s, wanted it to be something else. Because here's a postcard from, as they say, the unique Royal Hawaiian Motel. Now, this property is no longer with us, unfortunately, but you look at the bottom photo of that postcard and the lengths they've gone to to give this sort of a generic Polynesian look. You know, they say Hawaiian, but as we're about to see, this really could be sort of a stand-in for various parts of Polynesia. So why do all of this, you know, when you could just say, welcome to sunny Florida? I mean, Florida has plenty of its own tourism chart. Why make it why? Well, it wasn't just Daytona Beach doing this. This is a postcard from the same period. You can tell by the lovely lady's bouffant hairdo, this is 1960s. And this was the Hawaiian Isle and Inn in Miami Beach, Florida. And I know that... Um, one of the preceding presentations was on Wildwood and all of you got to see some of the wonderful examples of the beach motels up there. But what I found so intriguing was, why is this going on? Why pretend that Florida is something that it isn't? It does a very good job of standing in because it's got the climate, it's got the palm trees, it's got the really wonderful white sand for beaches, the whole nine yards, but why make it something it's not? And this is Traders that I was mentioning before, the restaurant and tiki lounge adjacent to the Aku Tiki Inn. So here are some of the reasons that tiki culture in the 1960s, really in the 1950s, then really getting full steam in the 1960s caught on. And part of that was because of a post-war affluence that servicemen coming back from World War II had. This was an era of prosperity and of travel for the new middle class. People could afford to have an automobile. They could take the whole family places and drive there instead of taking a train. So the kind of destinations they had were changing. When they got there, now when you're thinking about early, earlier 20th century travel, that was if you were going very far, very much train-based, when you got somewhere on the train, it was usually a major city. The train stations were often downtown and you just get off the train, walk out of the station and go to your hotel. And it was a grand hotel. 
Uh, if you're ever in Chicago, the Allerton Hotel is a good example of this. It's not one of the fanciest, but it still has a lot of that look to it. And you can imagine the people wearing their fedoras coming in with their steamer trunks and everything. But with car-based travel, you needed a different kind of lodging. And what you needed was a place, for one thing, that had parking to accommodate the automobile that was on major highways you could drive up to. And I'm probably preaching to a choir here. Most of you probably know, being in, in this association, how important the automobile was to defining a new type of lodging and a new, new types of restaurants and a lot of things going on. But it played a big role here. People were driving to Daytona. They were driving to Wildwood and all these places. The servicemen who had been in the Pacific Theater came back with stories and experiences from serving in World War II in the South Pacific. There was the infamous uh, Contiki expedition that happened in 1947, so this was a little bit further back, but inspired people to think about retracing the, the steps of Pacific Islanders. And all these things sort of congealed to make Polynesia uh, something that was on the collective conscious of the United States at the time. So, um, Brian, I have lost control of, uh, my slides aren't forwarding. Okay, you can't, you can't make it go forward, eh? I, it did to this slide, but now it's not moving. Something kind of flashed on the screen. It said Barbara somebody. Let me see if I can just, uh, Maybe try closing and opening it again. Yeah, I really apologize for this, folks. Yes, I, no that is really, really strange. Try to, um, I'm just going to pause the recording. Except it's not. Okay. 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 Sorry about that uh, little technical difficulty there. So an interest in Polynesia and the South Pacific was something that predated World War II. You know, if you ask people, even historians often, where did this fascination with Polynesian come from? Uh, a lot of people are going to say what I just said, that, well, it was the servicemen coming back from being in World War II in the Pacific theater. And that is a lot of it, maybe even the lion's share of it. But this fascination was growing, as many fascinations did in the early 20th century, through Hollywood. And I think no film embodied this better than Bird of Paradise, which was one of King Vitter's great productions in 1932. And of course, it charts uh, the tale, the narrative of a white sailor who gets marooned on this primitive but beautiful uh, island paradise. And of course, he meets this beautiful girl who, of course, is the princess of the local chieftain and they fall in love and it's you know, there's all of, all of that sort of thing going on. Star-crossed lovers and the cultures clashing. And, you know, this was something that in the collective conscious was igniting the idea that, okay, this is somewhere that is enchanting. This is somewhere that is romantic. And then when you have a serviceman coming back from actually being in these places, they were saying, yeah, I was actually there. This is what it was actually like. Even though it was a war, there's all these wonderful things about it. Now, of course, if you're familiar with World War II Pacific theater history, the battles were all over the place. So this adds to an interesting geographic dynamic that people weren't coming back and necessarily just saying, they might have said, you know, I was at Guadalcanal or wherever. And of course, a lot of them were funneling through Hawaii, but it became this sort of nebulous idea of the South Pacific Polynesian paradise. It wasn't just like this island or that island. It just started to squash together. And that had some interesting results of its own. When we look at the islands of the Pacific, and I wish this map showed a little bit more of Southeast Asia, but there's a lot going on there. I mean, these are all of the different little territories. Many under the Marshall Plan were leaving colonial powers post-World War II, getting their independence or having different arrangements with their, their former colonial powers. So a lot of stuff was going on. And of course, with the US, we had Hawaii. So we had our own island paradise, something that I figure most of you know, being interested in history, but some Americans I found are surprised by is not only did the US 
for a time, well, we still have Hawaii, but not only for a time did we have that, we got the Philippines in the Spanish-American War, of course. So we had the Philippines for quite a while too. All of this meant that there, like I said, it was nebulous, but there was this idea of this being a paradise. This wherever that is over there, as the old song goes, over there somewhere, there's really cool things that are exotic, embody the word exotic. So I wanted to jump back to this, the Hawaiian Isle and Inn, because as I said, this is a postcard. And, you know, you from a graphic design standpoint, you break this down. Of course, you have the guy and the gal talking on the, she's on the one meter board and uh, he's on the three meter board. Uh, I'm also a diver. So it's like, that's interesting. They had a three meter board at a hotel swimming pool. You don't see that these days. But you have that as the main image and you have an image of a beach and then you have an image of a dinner show that obviously has a Hawaiian or Polynesian theme. Now, this is intriguing because even though the Hawaiian Isle in Miami Beach is no longer there, there is a property in Daytona called the Hawaiian Inn. And to this day, they have this kind of dinner show. This is uh, called Polynesian Fire. And this is a promotional image that was taken from recent promotions for it at the Hawaiian Inn. So this is something you, you can still go right now and on the weekend go to a performance. You know, it's dinner and a show of Hawaiian, of or Polynesian Fire, excuse me. And it's been going on continuously, apparently, for many, many years, because this is an ad from probably the 1960s I found for that same dinner show. Now, the Hawaiian Inn, like I said, still there. It's uh, one of the other really intriguing properties as far as how it's trying to bring in this Polynesian ambiance and just how it manifests that. I love the, these gorgeous images of it from postcards. And today, this is where the dinner show is held. And my understanding and talking with them is with the management that's there today is that the dinner show's always been held in this auditorium. At one point, those doors you see would have been, this would have been the main entrance and exit to go into the dinner show. So it would have a separate entrance and exit than the hotel lobby. However, they've turned that into an emergency exit. And they have the Moai too here in these little alcoves. And they have this architecture that is supposed to be reminiscent of Polynesian architecture. Now, if we look at this, at sort of zooming into this postcard, we can see the port cochere that's up here that is their main entrance. And we can see the sign, which is no longer there. That sign that's circled in blue has been taken down at some point. Although, of course, the elevator housing below it is still there. And circled in red is what we were just looking at back here. So it's interesting to see from this vintage postcard that it was apparently always in the same colorway, that you had that sort of rusty burgundy for the roof, and then you had the yellow accents, and it appears that it's always been that way. But like I said, that would have originally been its own entrance to go in the auditorium for that dinner show. Now... This is an element that was added later, but I think it's pretty cool. I'm not sure what's under it or what's going on with that, but it's an interesting element that's trying to bring in more of the, the Polynesian flavor. But where does that exactly come from? What are they drawing on here? And again, I said, it's pretty nebulous. It is a hodgepodge of different perceptions of what Polynesia is like. The port cochere is very interesting because of two reasons. For one thing, we were just talking about how the automobile revolutionized lodging. And of course, if you're driving up to get your family out and go in and check into the hotel, you need a place to park the car. Even though we call it sunny Florida, any of you who live here or have been here a lot know that it could be in particularly the summer, really anytime, it could be raining just as easily as sunny. So you need a big carport or port cochere that you can park the vehicle under. So you see this, and they've taken advantage of the necessity of having a place that's covered to put the cars of guests that are driving driving in to check in. And they've drawn on the design of that Port Cochere from traditional architecture. And uh, the Ruma Adatora here that you see sort of center left there 
uh, has some red accents on it. That seems to be a lot of the inspiration of what's going on there. And these are all illustrations that were done by a graduate student in Indonesia in architecture and of traditional Indonesia. Now, these are just Indonesian traditional architectural styles, but you will see things that are very commensurate with this, with all these styles throughout the South Pacific, of course, under different local names and different languages, but something like that top example in the top left, you're going to see that. In fact, I found this older, really love this diagram, this older um, example, of four types of Pacific architecture. And as it says, it's eclectic. You know, this Fijian example in the upper left really doesn't look a whole lot like anything else that's going on. The one that's beneath it definitely doesn't look like the two circular ones that almost have a yurt kind of structure, particularly the one in the lower right. And you have the one, the Samoan one that is much like a yurt, but it's open. But the one thing they do have in common is the thatched roof, that you have interior rafters, in some cases exterior ones, as well as in the one in the lower left-hand corner, and you have a thatched roof. Now, not too long ago, maybe a month ago, I was out riding around Manatee Springs State Park here in Northern Florida on my mountain bike and came across this, that the park rangers have, and it's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the middle of a park that only if you go on this sort of back trail, you're going to find it. So it's very interesting that this structure's there. But this is a seminal a re reconstruction by the park rangers of a seminal chicky. And this would have been a traditional type of Seminole Native American lodging in Florida and other Native Americans in other parts of American South where the climate was appropriate for something like this utilize very similar things. So I wanted to throw that in there because the similarities, you know, in architectural style and approach and the pragmatism of using the type of materials they did and for results that they did for a type of climates they were in are very similar to what we see from Southeast Asia, from Indonesian example, on down into the South Pacific proper. And we see influence of that again, if we go back to the Aku Tiki. So why all this was going on, obviously they're trying to cater an experience, uh, ambiance and an experience because it's just having architecture that's evocative of something. You know, you have that floor show too. You're really trying to transport people there. And another way they did that, probably the most famous way that that was done was with the tiki drinks. And the tiki drinks, which were often rum based and many of them had other things in there too, but the tiki drinks really came about because of two men. Don the Beachcomber, who these examples uh, or the examples on the left come from and his rival trader, Vic, Victor Bergeron and Don Beach. And yes, his name was really Don Beach. Well, kind of. He legally changed his name to be Don Beach because he wanted to be at the beach so much. <laughs> so you had Don Beach, you had Victor Bergeron, who had Don the Beachcombers, and which was in LA, and Trader Vicks in Oakland, and later San Francisco, California. And then they both branched out and sort of had franchises or multiple locations. They were so successful. Of course, this coincided with the rise of American idea of the, the supper club as well. So with those libations, you had to have appropriate food to go with it. So you had Polynesian appetizers, such as a wonton or a Cantonese roll or barbecue spare ribs, all the stuff that you see on the right hand poo poo platter. We all know and hopefully love the poo poo platter. But were these things authentic? Were these things that were really coming from the, the Polynesian islands? That's very interesting because most of them were not. They may have been inspired. They may have been things that returning servicemen had had something akin to when they were in the South Pacific. But take, for example, the crab rangoon. And I bet wherever you live in America or Canada, you can probably go out to the local quick Chinese takeaway and on their list of appetizers, they're probably going to have the crab ragoon. We know what's in the crab ragoon. It's going to have crab or imitation crab in cream cheese. And then it's in this nicely, you know, quad corner folded deep fried dumpling. 
That's basically what it is. Now, Victor Bergeron at Trader Vic's for a long time said that when he was in the South Pacific, he was in Burma or a story change. You know, it'd be Burma one day, it would be somewhere actually in the islands the next. But he was somewhere. He was somewhere and supposedly had these. And he said, these are delicious. I need the recipe. And a beautiful maiden took him back to meet her old grandmother who made them by hand. And he's the only white person to ever get the secret recipe. Well, later come to find out that wasn't exactly the case. It seems that a chef by the name of Joe Young, who worked for Victor Bergeron, invented this. And that's been fairly well substantiated. The other interesting thing about the crab rangoon is a, mess, a mention of it even prior to Trader Vic's and Ber Victor Bergeron's use of it does kind of show up in this uh, social page write-up from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, May 24th, 1952. And I'll just pause and let everyone read this because there's a lot in there that's really interesting. But I do have highlighted of the things on the appetizer table. They had egg rolls, Rangoon crab a la Jack. So was that the same as today's crab rangoon? We're not really sure, but that's the first mention that, that anyone's been able to find. The other things I want to point out in this write-up of this uh, Hawaiian party that the Pittsburgh Field Club was having, first of all, we're going to talk a lot for a second about cultural appropriation because it is important in talking about a, a subject like this. And a good place to start is where they say that members and guests participating in this native fiesta, it's not sure why they're using the word fiesta for this, but okay, which will include dinner, dancing, and entertainment, are asked to come dressed as tourist or native. So this is obviously something we would not do today. We would not have, I'm assuming, predominantly white people dressing up as Hawaiian natives to come to a, a party. Just no, we're not going to do that. But in 1952, that'd be par for a course. It's interesting to see also that they even, among the, the great um, spare no expense effort they went to for this party, they even had palm trees with monkeys. I don't know if they were live monkeys. Uh, just, you have to wonder. You really have to wonder some of this stuff. But this was a combination of taking sort of cliff notes of the Hawaiian experience and particularly how white people had experienced Hawaii, how service men and their wives had experienced Hawaii, how colonizers had experienced Hawaii in creating sort of a greatest hits of it to propagate. Now, there would be music too, I'm sure at that party. And we sort of Hawaiian guitar music that you would get if you go to a, a touristy kind of luau today in Hawaii, or at least in recent years. I think things are thankfully changing somewhat now. For a long time, it was you know, very cliche and stereotyped. Uh, as it happens, my boyfriend is Chomero. He is from the island of Saipan, and he has lived in South Korea and also in the Philippines. He grew up in the Philippines. So he has been a huge help for me in researching all this. And he wanted me to point out that Young Pacific Islanders and Southeast Asians today have their own vision, obviously, of who they are. And these are four examples of people, of the rapper from Indonesia, Rich Brian, uh, the singer from Guam, Chad the Rivera, uh, Bright, who is an actor and singer from Thailand, uh, Pia Mia Perez, also from Guam and a pop singer. So, you know, these, we're not going to dwell on this since it's sort of aside from our topic, but uh, there is a song entitled Kids that came out in 2019 by Rich Brian, the Indonesian rapper. I highly, if you're interested in this, highly, highly, highly recommend going on YouTube and watching the music video for it. It's incredible. It had an incredible impact in Indonesia. Uh, the president of Indonesia actually sat down and watched it because people working in the presidential palace were talking about it so much. And it has, a, it has the vision that a young Indonesian man wants to portray of his own people. And I think that's great that we are at that point in history, instead of inviting people to come dressed as a native to a Hawaiian party. But what would they have had for music back then, probably at that Hawaiian party, and if you go to these things? Well, again, the ambiance is omnipresent. 
On the left hand, we have an example of some of the decor in that um, Traders Tiki Bar at the Aku Tiki Inn. And on the right, this is an album cover that uh, Bruce West, who was apparently the organist at Julian's Dining Room and Lounge in Ormond Beach, which Ormond Beach is, literally runs into Daytona. It's just north of Daytona and runs into it. And this was, uh, he was the organist there and he made an album. Now I haven't heard that one, but I actually play organ and keyboards myself. So I can tell you what is the Allen Theater organ. This is the Allen Theater organ. So that's the monstrosity he was playing there. But what is Julian's is more important for our purposes. Now, Julian's very sadly has been a casualty to um, development as well. You can tell it looks pretty vacant here. These are photos I took of it in 2019 when I learned that it was slated for demolition. Uh, it had closed, I think in 2014 or 15, it closed up as a long running, decades long running supper club. And it was sold and the new owner wanted to tear it down and put a gift shop in. Now, local preservationists were up in arms and they begged this guy to, they said, no, look, the gift shop's fine, but you could have, I mean, you can have a gift shop in this building. It's the right size. It's a great building for a gift shop. Why not? But he didn't want to do that. So it's no longer there. But you look at the design and you look at what we were looking at earlier you know, with the Polynesian inspirations and how much that's carried forth and, and how lovingly and detailed this is that you have the carvings there on the facade. And if you go up to the doors, you have the same on the doors as well. This is a selection of matchbook covers from, I got them on the internet. They're all over, not necessarily Daytona, but all over the country, uh, bars, supper clubs, restaurants, things like that, that are using very similar architectural motifs and inspiration. And now I want to return to the Royal Hawaiian Motel for us, because something that I know this group's very interested in, and I am too, is signage. And you look at that uh, picture, the lower half of this postcard of a Royal Hawaiian, and then apparently a little bit later, this was done. And I think this is just as bodacious and wonderful as you can get. As if they didn't have enough going on already, they have to add a neon girl. They added some decoration to that stone wall. And of course they have their name there in neon and they have a place to park your cars. I mean, to me, this is the epitome of the beachfront Daytona experience at the time with the idea of the automobile being king. And there are other great examples of signage from here. On the left, we have Carl the Viking. Uh, this is at uh, the Sun Viking Lodge, which is still there. And actually, if any of you go there, I highly recommend the Sun Viking. If you wanna stay in a, a historical property, it's actually kept up very well. The reason it is the Viking is the gentleman who started it years ago was from Norway. And he decided, and I think his name was Carl. So he went with the, he said, you know, this is what I know. And I think it's pretty cool. And he went with the whole idea of Vikings. And there's several statues of Carl the Viking around the property. And there's a long boat up behind him that we'll see more of in just a second. On the right, we have a surf view motel, which is no longer there, but has a great sign and the sea dip. The sea dip is still there and still called the sea dip, but that wonderful signage on the side of a building is no longer there, nor is it this uh, combination of sort of uh, ruby red and seafoam green, but it's still there, it's still in business. Tropical Manor, it's very interesting. It is playing more into the Florida theme. It's got the manatees on that garage door down there, the American flags, it's fully going right in there. It's true Florida. It's what they're saying of it. So that's interesting that this is one of the few to really embrace Florida as the, the topical theme. Not to be left out, there is a Mayan Inn also, and it's still there and you know ha takes advantage of everything that would be readily recognizable or surface recognizable about Mayan culture. So they bring that in. You have a Grand Prix hotel, which is interesting because of course you have a Daytona 500 and uh, racing's right turn and everything. It's uh, There's a long history of automotive, 
automotive racing in Daytona. They used to actually race on the beach. But you never had Formula One there until maybe a few exhibitions recently. So they have a Formula One, a little like kid-sized Formula One car there uh, by their signage. But I just found this really interesting that this is something else that they're playing up, you know, that racing connection. Here's another shot of the Sun Viking Lodge lit up at night. This is your main office. You can see how they've made excellent use of that A-frame and they have the long boat with Carl's image emblazoned on that sail. And this is quite something to see if you're driving down A1A at night, not necessarily expecting it. A lot of this is, I'm sure many of you have recognized, is coming out of Guji influence. Uh, there's not a whole lot of direct examples of classic Los Angeles Guji in Daytona, but I did find this postcard from a diplomat motel, which is no longer there. And I think it's long gone, but you look at that sign and you look at uh, really everything about it and very Guji, a lot of influence there. So, you know, when I was talking about atomic futures, of course, everyone's probably watched Oppenheimer. It's even more in people's mind. But, you know, this was the beginning of a Cold War. This was a time where uh, people were both enthused about America's success and technological and economic uh, benefits and prowess. But they were also scared of the Soviet Union at the time, and they were scared of how the atom bomb could be turned against them. But then there was uh, Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace and the whole initiative of, you know, Admiral Rickover and the nuclear submarines and just everything going on. It's sort of a two-edged sword. And the space race, of course, you had all this congealing the idea that the world was a bigger place. We could even go into space. We could go to Polynesia. We had a lot of things going on in America. But even if we go back pre-World War II to really the first time that tourism comes to Florida and it comes to Miami Beach, a few mere decades after a lady named Julia Tuttle opened up Miami Beach saying, hey, you can grow oranges here. And she sent Henry Flagler after all the orange groves in the northern part of Florida had frozen twice in the same year she bundled up, or as, at least as legend goes, she bundled up some of her juicy Miami oranges and sent them up the train to Flagler and said, come down here and grow some oranges. Bring people down here to grow some oranges. And they didn't just grow oranges. They built Art Deco hotels. And the main architect down there among several, but uh, Lawrence Dixon was a big figure there in bringing... New York Deco and making it Tropical Deco. And this is something that did have some impact. Certainly, I at least would argue that without Deco, you would not have had Gucci, you would not have had Papa Lux, you would not have had mid-century modern necessarily, that Art Deco is sort of the grandfather of a lot of that. But it did show up in Daytona as well. Now, this is on everything we've looked at so far. It's been on the beach side of Daytona. This is across the Halifax River on what we call mainland. Uh, just as an aside, there isn't Daytona in Daytona Beach. The whole city, everything's called Daytona Beach, city of Daytona Beach. But there's beach side and mainland across the Halifax River in an intercoastal waterway that separates sort of the, the peninsular part of Daytona. So this is a building that I believe is uh, pretty much abandoned now, but it is uh, there in downtown mainland side Daytona and a lot of Art Deco influence going on there. Even some here, particularly that Chinese restaurant that's all blue there. And this is on beach side, this is uh, on Main Street. So you see all this coming up and what it's glued together by, in my mind at least, is tourism that Daytona Beach is so, it's a lot of things. Uh, Daytona Beach is known for education. Uh, you know, Bethune-Cookman is there and it is the site of uh, the Black College reunion festivities, which is a major event. It's the site of Bike Week. It's the site of a lot of things to do with motorcycles and uh, automotive uh, interests in general. We have, they have Jeep Week there too. And of course they have the Daytona 500. Uh, there's several universities, Emory Riddle Aeronautical Universities in the area too, Daytona State College. But tourism is really what glues everything together. Uh, 
So I feel like they sort of pulled the greatest hits of Floridian tourism and things from further afield because you want to have, whenever you're building a hotel or motel or even a bar or restaurant, you want to have whatever's going to cater to the needs of your tourists, invite them in, get them intrigued, and get them to spend money. And this is now, what a lot uh, of uh, Mike, just, yes. just uh, we're, we're starting to get run out of time a little bit. Okay, let, thank you. I appreciate of, that. We have lots okay. of questions and comments, so we want gotcha. to take time for that. Gotcha. Well, we, we will go through, we're near the end, but I want to fly through some of these images really fast for you. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is another motel that uh, in 2019 it was there, but no longer is. I'm glad I got a picture of it. Really interesting lobby there. This is what Daytona looks like if you if you get on a roof somewhere. I'll just say that. This is a photo I took. And, uh, and you can see how built up it is now. Another example of a hotel that I like, this is what brings people there. The world famous beaches, the surfing. It's a beautiful place. And the people who live there embrace this as well with houses that are also eclectic. And, you know, how can you resist hanging a surfboard on the front porch and having a manatee holding your, your mailbox? And then at night, it becomes this very enchanted nightlife centric wonderland of its own. And this is what it looks like. Arcades and bars. And this is the tiki bar there that I went to that had just opened in 2019. I think it's already closed, very sadly. And it's not just Daytona. This is Cabana Bay. I wanted to close with this. Cabana Bay is, as some of you may know, a very new, in the last five years, built and opened property that's part of Universal Studios Orlando. And it was built to it's huge. It's absolutely freaking huge, but it was built to go back to the Guji architecture. And I talked to a manager of it when I was staying there and he said, yeah, Wildwood was the influence. He didn't say, say Daytona so much. He said, Wildwood, definitely. You know, they wanted this to be sort of the idea of the beach hotel with the Guji architecture. And this is what it looks like. This is your main check-in desk and lobby. This is your cafeteria and down as Universal and Disney are wont to do down to the most intimate details, you know, it's meant to take you back to that time. And those wide screens, those TV screens, they actually show endless loops of 1960s children's uh, Saturday morning cartoon commercials, not even the cartoons themselves, but just the commercials, which is really interesting. So thank you all. Thanks to these people who have been so so helpful to me and uh i don't know brian do you want me to leave this up so people can get my email or what do you want me to do yeah please leave that up and, and okay uh, great. although we may want to uh jump back and forth yeah we may need to jump back and look at some stuff but that is great well mike i want to thank you for an absolutely fascinating presentation uh there's all sorts of, of excellent uh comments and and uh kudos on the chat which i will send you after the after we're done tonight. So um, yeah. the audience has really been enjoying it. And we were up to our, at our highest point, we were up to 59 uh, viewers tonight, which is very good for, I think in August, uh, nice summer evening in, in August. Uh, we also have a whole pile of comments and chats here. So I'm gonna start plowing through some of these. Um, the, the first one was from Jean Mercer Ballot. And she asked about the, uh, the first hotel that you showed, the Best Western. She says, my graduate thesis was on Polynesian themed restaurants, restaurants in the mid-century and I'm obsessed with tiki, with tea and tiki culture. Uh, I teach interior design, mainly hospitality and retail and lighting. And she wanted to know, I think she wanted, oh, sorry. Somebody wanted to know when that building was built, if you, um, if you have any idea of that. It was in the early 1960s, and most of the properties we were looking at were from the early 1960s. Right. I, I have not been able to find a specific date for the Aku Tiki. I have tried, uh, but no one no one who actually is there at the property seems to know anything. <laughs> so, uh, but, but it was definitely the early 1960s, as was the Hawaiian Inn we looked at. Right. Actually, it was Gene that asked that. Do you, do you know when this was built? Uh, now, there's a, a fellow named Tori Laitila. I'm sure I'm saying that wrongly, uh, who's joined us tonight. And I believe that he is in Hawaii right now. And uh, he makes an interesting comment. He says, we can say 
tiki texture, you know, architecture, tiki texture. So yeah. that's, I think, a, quite a very interesting comment. Um, Hawaii became a, a state in 59, Marshall Feldman says. So that might have had an influence on the thing. And Susan Bregman also wonders if the musical South Pacific was an influence. Could you comment on that? I think, I think definitely, definitely on, and thank you for bringing that up. I, I did mention, you know, America having Hawaii as a state. I, I think it was a confluence of things. I think even before Hawaii was a state, you know, it was on the collective conscious and definitely with World War II, you know, the attack of Pearl Harbor was most certainly on our conscious. And then as sad as it is, I mean, how many how many Americans really knew that much about Ukraine until unfortunately it was invaded? I mean, it, it, as you announced, a lot of my work is actually on Russia, too. So I knew something. But how, how many people knew Kosovo until there was a problem there? Uh, so very sadly, you know, a lot of places in the South Pacific became on the American agenda when we sent troops there. But I think the musical South Pacific, uh, Bird of Paradise, the movie I mentioned, all that and more really factored into this. It was kind of a final frontier until we decided to launch ourselves into space, wasn't it? I mean, <laughs> it, it was the area that was less known still, and you still had that allure. You know, the Caribbean was explored. You still had this idea that you might be on your boat and over a horizon come to this island paradise nobody had ever seen before. Right. Now, Rachel Yule, I, Rachel, I'm going to unmute you if you want to have a little a, a discussion here with Mike. But she says, I'm curious about how cultural appropriation fits into this discussion and specifically how do the indigenous cultures feel about the tiki culture? Well, I can, you know, I, I'm not indigenous and I won't dare speak for anyone who is. Uh, my boyfriend is Chamorro, so he, you know, is indigenous to Saipan, and of course that is uh, Saipan and Guam and the other islands are also part of the United States. Not everyone knows that, but uh, they are. And um, and that's also a product, I believe, of Spanish-American War. Uh, so I talked to Tyler a lot about this and his feeling is, he said, he said he loves tiki culture, but he said it'd be nice if people think more about where things come from and realize that a lot of these islands have not just their own language, but multiple languages. He lived in the Philippines and he said the Philippines has, I don't know if this is true, but he said probably over a thousand languages. But when you think of how many islands compose the nation of the Philippines, that makes sense. When we think of the language Filipino, Tagalog, that is sort of a composite national language in several uh, in Papua New Guinea, I believe they did the same thing because they have all these different languages. They have all these different insular cultures. So it's, I think his concern and other friends I've talked to who are Asian and Pacific Islander, I started working on this in 2019 when I was still in grad school. And as it happened, three of my housemates in Savannah where I lived were all Chinese. So I discussed a lot of them, this with them. And, you know, they kind of chuckled and said, well, it's good that you're saying something because everyone thinks anyone who's Asian is Chinese, Japanese or Korean. I said, I know, I know, you know, it's uh, and thankfully that's changing a lot. But that's why I pointed out this Indonesian rapper, Rich Brian, and what's going on now, what young people especially are doing in art forms like music to express what their culture is really like. Uh, Rachel, you're unmuted. Did you want to say anything? Yeah, just curious. I mean, obviously, like, it's a very different time than the 1950s. And, um, you know, no better, do better. And I think we all um, strive for that in today's world with the idea of appropriation and, and making sure we're really being respectful and, and, you know, especially being a white person, which I am, like, uh, you know, just being careful with with that respect level. So I was just curious how this, how that kind of, you know, again, played into that discussion. So. I mean, so much of it is, well, first I should say, I I do have a lot of friends since my boyfriend's Shamora who are PAC Islanders and no one has ever, at least to me, expressed any animosity towards tiki culture. Most of them think it's great. But like I said, what does rightfully upset them is confounding one culture with another, sort of lumping everything together 
uh, which I got to a little bit in this presentation, you know, there is a, a lot of similarity between what we see across these islands and not just islands, but again, when you get into Indonesia, when you get into Thailand, but I think things like uh, Chef Young and Victor Bergeron inventing the crab rangoon and hopefully if someone was in that position today, in my view, they wouldn't make this backstory up of how he learned about it when he was in Burma and it's a traditional dish and he was someone's grandmother gave him the recipe or whatever. Hopefully they would just come and say, you know what? I was in the South Pacific and I looked at the culinary, the food waste there. And I had my chef come up with something that was inspired by that, you know, call it what it is. And I think that's very important. There's cultural, cultural inspiration and all cultures take inspiration. And appropriation, I think, is where you either don't credit people correctly or you take things that are sacred or very important, such as, I mean, sort of classic example is if a white person put on a Native American headdress and they have no Native blood, that I would not be appropriate. Uh, but I think there can be accusations of appropriation that go a bit too far. Uh, one example real fast would be the singer Gwen Stefani a number of years ago, around 2005, 2006, she had this album called Harajuku Girls that was inspired by Harajuku, which is a sort of nightlife and shopping, very youngish area of Tokyo. And some people accused her of a cultural appropriation, having these Japanese dancers who were who were in her videos and everything. And she responded very well to it, saying, you know, first of all, they are actually Japanese. These are people I met in these dancers I got from Japan. They wanted to work with me. Secondly, if you know about Harajuku culture, it is a hodgepodge of influences. There is a style that some girls wear there that's called Gothic Lolita. So it's very much sort of uh, this dark Victorian with a lot of lace and stuff. But let's think about that. Where does European Gothic come from? That's not Japanese. Where does Lolita come from? That's not Japanese. They have the Japanese schoolgirl outfits that originally come from European, especially British schoolboy outfits. So there's cultural influence going in many directions in many of these cases. What I, what I personally, just my personal opinion is most important is that the people who originate things get credit for originating them and that they get to express those things the way they want to. And that's sadly something that no, in the 1950s and 60s in America wasn't happening. I would bet good money that every person, you know, who's owning these restaurants and hotels, most of them probably, particularly in Florida, probably were white men. That's a, an interesting observation. Mike, I have a, a comment here from Tori Laikila, who I'm, again, sure I'm mispronouncing that. Unfortunately, he's no longer on the line, but... I believe he said that he is, was viewing this from Hawaii. He says there's a difference between tiki and ki, uh, spelled K-I-I. -I. We, we, we reserve ki for religious and cultural usage, but tiki culture is really a combining of Oceania and Asia for its uh, exoticism, which I think is just exactly what you said. Yeah, that's right. And uh, another thing, you know, I mentioned the Kontiki expedition. The thing is, tiki in the United States has come to mean sort of uh, this bar culture. And in Florida, it often goes a bit further, uh, which I find is a little bit irksome, where it's not even the style of drinks and everything that we associate with tiki. Sometimes in Florida, a tiki bar is just any outdoors bar at a hotel or something. They put some a bar by the pool and they call it a tiki bar. It doesn't need to have anything else. It could be a Mexican themed tiki bar. They, I've seen that done. You know, so it loses a lot of the real meaning, but it also shows how, uh, you know, terms take on a life of their own. And we're, we're in a unique historical position now with the internet and with everything we have that it's a lot easier for us to say, no, this is where this came from and to verify things and check on things than where they were in the 1950s or 60s. Now we'll take a couple more questions here. Danya White uh, asks the question, does Florida give tax credits for historic preservation or some type of incentives? Oh boy, 
Uh, they have, those laws have changed fairly recently. And there was a push, I forget the, the gentleman's name, but there was a South Florida Congress person uh, or sta a state representative, sorry, state representative, forget the guy's name, but uh, last year he tried to do away with all historic preservation restrictions, even in Miami Beach, even in St. Augustine, because I think this guy, before he became a politician, he was a hotel developer. So he wanted to do away with everything so he could put in sort of the hotels we see in the this the slide that's up right now, probably. Thankfully, there was a strong public pushback and the legislation didn't go through, but he said he'd bring it again and he could. And it's honestly, uh, who knows? I mean, there are credits and things, but the development lobby in Florida is probably other than tourism, the most powerful political lobby here. There's development all the time and they, some of them are very culturally minded and preservation minded, but I would say most of them are interested in putting up the biggest money generating things they can it seems like that's not just florida i can assure you no it's not just florida <laughs> it's not just florida but it's i think the thing to say and th this is the one thing that i wish i i had included that i forgot to there's been several new hotels in daytona over the past five years and they're all high rises and by high rises i don't mean eight to twelve floors i mean 20 floors and they're very high-end hotels they're, you know, they're not quite like the Four Seasons or Ritz Carlton level, but they're they're high end. They're not like the things I was looking at. So they're they're meant to make as much money per guest as possible. They're also meant to house as many guests as possible. Yes, of course. Um, and Emily, I think you're unmuted. You had a good question for uh, Mike, and you're also the person that recruited Mike. So can you um, ask your question? Sure. Um... Hey, Mike, thank you so much for hey, coming Emily. on. Hey, thank you. <laughs> you. Finally talk, not just through email. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, my question is, what is the most authentic, that's in air quotes, uh, Polynesian hotel or motel that you visited? And that could be Florida or anywhere in the U.S. And then was it your favorite? And if not, what was your favorite? I, you know, I don't think... You, you can't say any of the examples I've looked at tonight are authentic Polynesian or Hawaiian examples. Uh, they may be authentic in the sense that there are in Hawaii today similar uh, hotels, but as far as indigenous authentic, none of them really are. I think okay. as far as, you know, in, in the, this is, I guess this is the main this is my presentation, you know, is that tiki culture became this thing unto itself. It is a fantasy drawing on realities. It's almost to me, I would compare it to when a fantasy writer writes about kings and castles and she puts in, you know, someone like Mercedes Lockey or somebody like that puts in dwarves and elves and dragons. Well, she might be looking at the reality of medieval England, but then she creates a fantasy out of it. And that's what was done with tiki culture. They looked at the reality to an extent of Polynesia and created something else out of it, is how I like to look at it. And like I said, though, a lot of people who are Pacific Islanders in Southeast Asia love this just as much as anyone else. And they are doing things with it, which I think is great and how it should be. But uh, to your question, which one did I, which hotel did I like the most? Um, I liked the Aku Tiki Inn the best, but I'm so sad of what's been done there uh, to a Port Cochere in the, the lodge, the lobby area. Uh, as far as where I stay, like if I was to go surfing tomorrow, I would definitely stay at the Sun Viking because it's just kept up clean and they're really nice people and it's fun. And I also like the fact that, like I said, the guy that came in was, forget if he's Norwegian or Swedish, but he he was, I, I think he's passed away now, but the guy, Carl, who started the Sun Viking actually came from the culture he was representing. And kudos to him to, you know, to do that and say, yeah, Vikings are cool. Let's do some Viking stuff instead of grab from someone else's culture. <laughs> okay, thanks, Mike. Now, David Peterson asks, uh, how would you compare Disney's Royal Polynesian decor to these resorts in Daytona? 
Oh, it's very similar. It is very similar. And Disney definitely, you know, Disney gets uh, accolades for a lot of things they've done, usually deservedly so. Uh, but one thing they are very good, particularly when Uncle Walt was still with them, was seeing the cultural pulse of America. And okay, Americans are enchanted by the space race. So we're going to have Tomorrowland and we're going to have Space Mountain. And okay, people like pirates. We're going to have Pirates of the Caribbean. And the same thing for Polynesian influence. They were doing very similar things. And they probably even looked at some of the early uh, things that, that predated them. And I'm sure they looked at uh, Bird of Paradise and drew from that. I, if there was one film reference that I would go to, it would be Bird of Paradise because it's so early yet so good at seeing a lot of the the thematic things that we find in the architectural manifestations, material, cultural manifestations later. Now, here's our last question for tonight, although there's lots more in the chat, which you can see when you when you get it. Jory Miller asks, uh, Wildwood was mentioned. Is it fair to say that Wildwood, Wildwood was, to a large extent, imitating Florida, including Florida's imitation of other cultural elements? I... I think there was cross-pollination. I would be really interested to see uh, what the person that did the Wildwood presentation would say on that. I think they were communicating. I think Wildwood was its own thing, but it was probably looking at Florida. It was looking at Los Angeles too. I think if there was another locale it was looking at, it was Los Angeles. It was looking at the Gucci architecture there. And also, you know, the palm trees and beach ambiance of LA. And I think Wildwood is... Those of you who have been to LA, you know it's not the tropics. You know that it can be hot and sunny, but again, I surf. You usually need a wetsuit if you're surfing in Southern California. It's not the tropics, but it has the palm trees and the sun. So it was a good stand in. And of course, with Hollywood, that was propagated. So I think LA probably uh, was a, a big influence on Wildwood. Okay. Well, I'm going to cut off the questioning because we're absolutely running out of time. We're actually over time right now. But okay. I just wanted to uh, thank you again very much, Mike. Oh, and I, a, a little personal aside. I actually stayed at the C. Dip Hotel. I, I live in Did Toronto, you? Toronto, Canada, and I took a trip in my uh, a sophomore year at university or second year, as they call it here, uh, with some friends on March break. And we drove 24 hours nonstop to Daytona. And uh, went and and stayed at the Sea Dip Hotel. I've got the pictures to prove it, actually. From <laughs> so, so it had, did it. I, I've got to ask, did it have the signage? Yes, it did it have the time. signage at that That's time. Great, yeah, great. It was still there. That, that would have been 1988 or 89, perhaps. So okay. the signage was still there at that time. So again, thank you, and thank uh, you, audience, for coming out tonight on a beautiful summer evening. Yes, thank you, everyone. I just want to uh, remind everybody about next week's presentation when on or next month, I should say, on, on Wednesday, September the 20th at, at 8 p.m. Eastern. We uh, will join host, uh, we will host Robert Hadlow, PhD, a senior historian with the Oregon Department of Transportation, as he takes us on a ride down the Columbia River Highway, America's first highway. SCA members will be receiving the relevant details and registration link by email and others can register through the SCA website directly. Uh, for those of you that watch tonight that are not members, expect an email shortly inviting you to enjoy the SCA and enjoy all the benefits of membership, including our monthly Zoom series. And also remember that this presentation tonight and all the questions and answers will be available on the SCA's website which is www.sca-roadside.org, uh, probably tomorrow. And uh, if there you have friends and relatives that would enjoy it but didn't see it, they can watch it there for free. Any last words, Mike, that you'd like to say? Well, thank you again for the opportunity. Emily, thank you for seeing. Emily saw a presentation I did on the same topic at the 2020 Vernacular Architecture Forum, and that was, you know, the genesis of, of this happening. So... Uh, she deserves all the credit on that. Uh, thank you, Brian, also for all of your help and audience for coming. And yeah, if anyone has questions, I know you said there's someone who uh, who teaches interior design. If 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 any of you have questions, just email me. I'll look at the chat too. But if you have something that's pertinent to your own research or anything, feel free to email me at any time. 
Well, thank you, Mike. And with those final words, I will bid everyone a good night, and I look forward to seeing you again next month.